In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, Paul lays out the essentials of the gospel. And he says that Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures, that he was buried and that he rose from the dead. Those three things. Now, if you are to eliminate one of those three things, if you were to take it away, if you were to try to decide which of those three things are the uh, least important, is his death, or his burial, and his resurrection, which one you say, okay, we could, we could maybe do without that. Uh, for most people, they would probably say that his burial, you know, we tend to emphasize that Jesus died for our sins, and then that he he, he became alive again. He was resurrected. Uh, the fact that he was uh, buried in, in the ground, buried in a tomb, yeah, that happened historically, but is there really so much significance to that? Uh, well, the writers of the New Testament would seem to think so, that his burial in a tomb was very important, that it's an essential part of the gospel, that it would not have been the same had he simply died and they laid his body on the table, and then some days later he was rector resurrected. But why is that? Well, I'm, I'm going to try to unpack that here. In, in addition, along with that, there, there's two key details uh, regarding his burial that the Gospels and uh, the writers of the New Testament emphasize. First of all, three of the four Gospels, uh, Matthew, Luke, and John, they all emphasize the fact that this was a new tomb. The, this tomb had never been used before. Now, this is not some throwaway detail. Three of the gospel writers go out of their way to include this. Uh, these people were not writing on a blog where you have limited space. They had parchment, and it, it was very limited how much material they could get into it. So every detail mattered. Therefore, if three of the gospel writers are clarifying that this gospel, or this tomb rather, had never been used before, that it was a new tomb, this is important. But why? Why is that important? What if it had been used before? Would it have made any difference? It is. Secondly, it, the great emphasis is put on the fact that he uh, he was dead for three days. He was buried. Three days later, he came out. Why three days? Would, would he have had the same thing had it happened in two days, four days, five days? Why three days? Why, why is that so much emphasized? Why is that detail uh, in regards to his burial so important? Well, first of all, let's talk about his... Um, Let's go back to the beginning. Let's go back to Genesis uh, chapter 3. You know, you get uh, many people say Genesis 3.15 is the first real messianic prophecy. Now, in some ways, I think we get hints of it even in, before that, and uh, maybe we'll go there. But in 3.15, God is speaking to the serpent. Men, Adam and Eve had just sinned. The serpent had tempted them. They'd fallen into sin. And God shows up and he curses the serpent. And he said, I will put hostility between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. And he will crush your head and you will bruise his heel. Meaning someone's coming who will be known as the seed of the woman. And the one who's the seed of the woman will crush Satan's head and his seed, all of his offspring uh, forever. So this is, for us as Christians, we look forward to and say, yes, this is Christ who at the cross crushed the enemy's head, even though he himself was bruised, so to speak, in the process. Well, this idea of the seed then travels from Genesis 3.15 all the way through the Old Testament. It, when God calls Abraham, he says, it's through your seed that the nations will be blessed. And then Isaac and Jacob and fast forward about 400 years or so, and you get to, to King David and, and God speaks again to King David through your seed. You know, uh, I, I'm going to give the blessings and all the promises I give to you, I'm going to give to your seed. And I'm giving you the promise that you shall not see corruption, but that promise is really ultimately for your seed. And so when Jesus shows up uh, as claiming to be the Messiah, this is the seed that was promised. Now, this is why Jesus says in, um, right, you know, in, in the days leading up to his crucifixion, he says in John chapter 12, he said, uh, unless a seed falls into the ground and dies, it remains alone. But if it falls into the ground and dies, it grows to bear much fruit. The fact that G Jesus was the seed that would bear fruit through all the world is why he needed to be buried. 
okay? He is the great seed. He needs to be put in the ground, and he comes out of the ground to bear fruit all throughout the world. The reason, and, um, it's Acts 13 that uses this. Uh, Acts 13 looks back at Psalm 2, and in Psalm 2, God speaks, and he says uh, about the coming Messiah. He's speaking to David, but he's speaking about David's descendant, David's seed. And he says, you are my son. Today, I have begotten you. And what Paul does with that messianic psalm in Psalm 2, he looks back and says that that declaration of you are my son today I have begotten you, that that's that proclamation that was to David but was really to David's descendant inherited by David's seed, the Messiah, that that proclamation was about his resurrection. Normally, when we think about uh, Jesus being begotten, we maybe think of Christmas. Well, you know, Jesus came into the world through uh, through the virgin uh, womb of Mary. You know, he in Christmas he came all through the virgin womb of Mary. But when when Psalm two is speaking of Jesus being begotten, it, it's not a reference to Christmas. It's a reference to Easter. See, Jesus was born with a corruptible human nature at Christmas, but he was born with an incorruptible human nature at Easter. Jesus at Christmas was born through a virgin womb, but at Easter, he was born again through a virgin tomb. And this is why it's important. They emphasize the fact that the tomb had never been used. It was a, it was a new tomb uh, because just as Jesus was born in the world through a virgin womb, he was born through a virgin tomb uh, at Easter into an incorruptible life. Paul says, that that promise in, in, in Psalm 2 is uh, is applied, not at Christmas, but at the resurrection. Well, why day three? Well, I, of course, some people might look back in Jonah. There's the prophecy of Jonah, just as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the whale. So with Jesus, sure, the, that is a fulfillment of prophecy. But I think we can go back even deeper if we go back to not Genesis 3, but Genesis 1. Here's a question. When did life first appear on earth? Well, if you're following Genesis chapter 1, the first day, you know, God says, let there be light and there's light. And then the second day comes and uh, God separates the, the, you know, the skies and the sea. And then on the third day, God says, let dry land appear and let the seeds sprout up and bear forth fruit and fill the earth with fruit trees according to their seed. It's on day three that life shoots up out of the ground and uh, the seeds bear fruit all over the world. And just like God brought life to our planet on day three of creation, he brings eternal life, the victorious life of Christ that will bear fruit all over the world on day three. Another fact to consider that's often overlooked is that Jesus was resurrected on the festival of first fruits. You can look this up in, oh, I might forget the chapter, Leviticus 23. 24, 25, 26, when they're talking about the festivals, Jesus rose on the, the festival of first fruits. According to the Passover calendar, this is the, the week uh, you know, of unleavened bread there, and it is the day after the Sabbath of Passover where the celebration of first fruits is to be observed, where they bring in the very initial bits of the harvest of the year and offer it up in the spring. From the spring harvest, they offer up to God in anticipation of the much larger harvest that will come later on. This is why Jesus is called, in Paul and Colossians, he is the first fruit. He is the first fruit that's offered up to God and will one day, uh, in anticipation of the much greater harvest that's going to happen all over the world uh, when Christ comes again and there is the resurrection of the living and the dead. Uh, so these are some reasons why, uh, why the burial is so important and the details around the burial are so important. If you have any more thoughts on this, love for you to uh, leave a comment below and uh, love to hear what you have to say. God bless. Bye.